Hello everyone and welcome to the second instalment of the VVOX Spring Pedagogy Webinar Series. My name is Danielle and I'm one of the customer success representatives here at VVOX. And as I said before, this is the second instalment with our wonderful presenter today, Laura Jenkins. And she's going to go a bit more into formative and mid-module feedback and using VVOX and how she incorporates that into her lessons, etc. But just before we get started, I just want to say again, a big thank you to Laura, who was so wonderful in agreeing to be part of our webinar series. This is the second instalment. We do have one previously um, on our YouTube channel, so you can go on YouTube and have a look at that. But I think without further ado, I'm going to get started by just introducing Laura a little bit more. She is a university teacher at the University of Loughborough with over 10 years of experience. And she's also one of our members of our VBOX community. She is a very avid member and she has been so vocal and such a team player in terms of helping us out, in terms of communicating ideas and helping other members of our community. So thank you so much to Laura. And without further ado, I want to hand over to you. Um, so thank you everyone for um, attending this webinar. Um, it is quite a pleasure to be asked to do this. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of the next 30 minutes or so while I'm talking a little bit about sort of why and how I use Vivox. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about why I use Vivox at Loughborough University in terms of providing students with um, formative feedback in classes and also in terms of module feedback as well because module feedback gives us as educators a chance to sort of find out a little bit more about how the students are finding the modules and progressing with the modules and VVOX is one of the ways in which we can do that as well. So what I will do is I will start off by just introducing myself and then I'll talk more about sort of how I use VVOX as well. Um, so just as a little introduction, my name is Dr Laura Jenkins and I am a university teacher within psychology. Uh, my role is very, very student faced, so I do teach across quite a lot of modules. At the minute, I'm very cognitive based, so I'll teach and lead modules in applied cognitive research. Um, I'm also one of the co-leads of our final year um, dissertation module as well, alongside one of my colleagues. Um, and most recently, I have stepped up to be um, the psychology placements coordinator. So in that role, I sort of um, work with the placements colleagues as well to um, ensure that our students are out on placements um, and just to ensure that they are doing quite well as well. Um, outside of Loughborough, I am a writer and a correspondent for um, an online platform called PsychReg. If anyone does want to view any blog posts, you can just type in psychreg.org into Google and that website will pop up. And I tend to write blog posts on um, sort of cognitive psychology and education as well. So sometimes I'll talk a little bit about what I've used in the past in terms of um, different tools. Very recently, I've uh, written a blog post about VVOX as well. So please do read that um, if you're interested in those sorts of areas. It's not an academic website, so it's very, very sort of based for the general public. Um, as much as I don't do a lot of research myself, um, in terms of my undergraduate dissertation students, I will teach and sort of supervise areas in relation to personality. And in particular, most recently, sort of the dark triad traits of personality and how that can link to, you know, academic misconduct and how students perceive um, what academic misconduct is as well so that is just sort of a brief overview of me and sort of how I've progressed over the past few years as well um I've worked in a number of UK institutions up in Strathclyde all the way down in Oxford Brook University so I've had a few different um experiences about different UK universities as well so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about what formative feedback is and why it's important in terms of the education system it can also be important in terms of employment as well but because i am sort of more education based that uh, things that i talk about will be related to um sort of undergraduate level and um, the things that i've taught in the past i'll mention a little bit about previous ways in which i've provided formative feedback um to students in the past and whether or not these have worked some have worked some haven't worked and then that will sort of lead me on to talk a little bit about vivox and how i have used that as well most recently for formative feedback but then within the last couple of weeks as well we started using vivox for very informal module feedback as well and that's now sort of quite widely in loughborough university as well 
So what is formative feedback? In general, formative feedback is where we as educators provide students with different tasks and different activities that will promote their understanding and knowledge and will sort of help with those skills um, that students will learn throughout their degrees. Now, there are many, many uses of formative feedback and, you know, we can do these in a written format. If we give draft feedback, we can also do them in more spoken feedback if we are in a very, very large lecture situation. But in general, one of the main uses of formative feedback is to try and engage learners with whatever topics they are learning. So I teach areas of cognitive psychology and there are times when the concepts can be quite complicated. So I will tend to um, give students questions and provide a little bit of formative feedback so that the students can then reflect on that content and can reflect upon sort of how well they are progressing through the content as well. Now, in general, formative feedback is supposed to be motivational. The research is a little bit mixed out there. So it's it's one of those things where it's not formative feedback isn't the only thing that's involved it's a case of it's also a case of um, what topic students are studying whether their attendance is involved whether the learning is online and offline as well so while formative feedback can be motivational it's only that tip of the iceberg and there's many many other uses for formative feedback as well but one of the main things about formative feedback is that it's actually been shown to enhance and improve student performance and you can see quite a few researchers there who have a look at this. And what we do is at Loughborough, we tend to explain to students um, something called the feedback loop. So we will provide students with an assessment. We will explain to the students how they can then use that feedback at a later date. And we will also do this in lectures as well. So when I am providing sort of lectures and use VVOX, we will always use the word feedback and I will explain to students how they can use the feedback given for sort of you know, their assessments and further um, assessments as well. So before we do anything, um, I've placed the VVOX ID just on the bottom there. If anyone would like to log in um, and respond, but in general, if anyone can sort of have an idea of what they mean by good feedback, um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that because it might take you a minute or so to get logged in. Um, and I will also log in as well. OK, so as you can see on the screen there, there's quite a lot of good words that have been used here. So feedback, as a lot of you have said that it must be constructive. Now, if you tell students that they have done something wrong, that's not going to help students at all. You need to be constructive and maybe suggest some improvements as well. The feedback also needs to be helpful and useful. And that is very, very important because if the students can see how they can use that feedback, then they are more likely to apply that feedback to future assessments as well. Um, one of the most interesting terms here is the word scaffolded. So I am, I do teach quite a lot of developmental psychology and the word scaffolded comes up quite a lot now. Feedback is quite good. And if we provide good feedback, it means we can scaffold the students, we can provide the students with a little bit of support there as well. So we're not giving the students all of the answers. We're not telling them that they are doing things wrong. We are sort of providing that basic level of support as they are progressing through their degrees. And that is what essentially good feedback should be. But excellent, thank you very much. There are some really good words on there as well. So in terms of the previous methods that I have used, um, I've used sort of quite a few different methods, but there's four key ones that I'm going to talk about um, over the next minute or so. Um, and essentially, I'm going to answer this question straight away. Have my previous methods worked? The answer is not really. Um, and I'll explain why as I'm talking um, about those different methods in a moment. So over the past 10 years of teaching and over a cross of multiple institutions that I've um, worked in, I have often quite used class quizzes. So this will be providing students with um, an opportunity to complete a little quiz in class time. And yes, the students will do that. But in some cases, the students don't understand why the quizzes are happening. Um, and what I find is as an educator, um, quizzes do take a lot of time to set up. So there's loads of different pieces of software out there, such as Kahoot, that you can use for class quizzes, but they do take quite a lot of time to set up. And in some cases, you don't get a lot of engagement with those. 
there's sometimes quite a low response rate so you need to weigh up whether it's worth taking the time and effort or whether it's worth sort of looking for another piece of software as well now what i also do is when i'm lecturing so i sometimes or quite frequently lecture to a cohort of 350 students there's times where i do direct questions to the students now in some cases it, I will actually direct them to specific students if um, they look like they've got something to say. But in some cases, I won't. It'll sort of be a generic question um, from the students. But um, as an educator, I quite frequently experience um, students not wishing to respond. And that is absolutely fine. Some students are not comfortable in that. So this is one of the reasons why we also use VVox as well, um, because it is fully anonymous, unlike if you're asking questions within a lecture. And I also use hands up activity. So this is um, essentially not selecting out any specific student. I will ask students to close their eyes and put their hands up. But in general, with these types of activities, unless a student can see why they are happening, why you are giving them those sorts of questions, there will be a lack of response as well. And I find that hands up activities don't provide that high level of engagement that you need for students of, sort of, of any level, whether you're first years or even final years. So what I have done most recently is use student to student discussion. So I will maybe split the lecture theatre into you know groups of students or if I'm in a smaller class it's often easier to navigate that but again what you will find is that a lot of students may go off topic um, they may start discussing what they did at the weekend rather than trying to keep on topic and keep focus so it works but only to some extent as well so one of the main issues that I have found with sort of everything that I've used you know whether that's quizzes or questions from a lecturer is that there is a lack of engagement. Now, there could be many, many reasons for this. It's not solely about the students not participating. It could be the fact that as lecturers, we have not explained to students why participation is important. Some students just don't understand why they are being asked to do activities and lectures. Um, and that is sort of something that us as educators need to um, allow the students to understand. So we need to provide a little bit more information. Some students have negative attitudes about participation and especially in some of the research most recently, um, what we do find is that if something doesn't contribute to a student's final grade, this actually does encourage a lack of engagement. So we often have to highlight as educators why the tasks are important and this hopefully then slowly starts to increase engagement. Now, what I have found this evening, I, if I have a lecture theatre of 350 students, you'll sometimes find that maybe only 10 or 11 students participate. So what we know is that we can use uh, VVox to try and sort of solve any issues that have been apparent with the sort of the previous methods that I have used. So when I am in lectures and sort of smaller classes of maybe up to 30 students, I will try to make activities fun to encourage participation. And that is why I tend to use VVox to do this. VVox, in a sense, is a fun way of getting students to know the content of the workshops and the lectures. I also ensure that I praise and thank students for participating. So every time I run a VVox activity, I will always say thank you to the students who have taken part. And in a sense, that makes the students feel good that they have participated. And that's one of the good things about VVox as well. It's fully anonymous, so there's no names associated with any of the answers. So then it's easier for me to just thank the whole class and I would never, ever target specific students. But one of the main things that I try to do in my lectures is I try to change the negative perceptions to positive ones. So if students believe that they shouldn't be participating because there is no grade attached, I do try and change that perception a little bit by explaining to students that participation is important. It allows me to sort of offer more support if I see that a student or a group of students is struggling. So VVox has helped us to, to do all of these things. It's allowed us to make learning fun by providing students with different activities. And I'll give some examples um, in a moment of what we have done with the students. And in a sense, it has increased engagement. Um, and I will talk in a moment about a case study that I ran with um, a group of students who were um, not really sort of engaged with the content and we introduced VVox um, and we got some really good feedback um, from that as well. 
one of the key things and one of the main reasons of what VVOX has helped us to do is to ensure that students know when we are giving feedback. So every time we use VVOX, I will use the word formative feedback just so students are aware that it's not just a fun activity, but it's a way for me and the rest of my colleagues to provide some feedback to the students as well. So all students at Loughborough have the opportunity to download the My Loughborough app, which gives students um, details of their timetables and they can check emails and look at different things such as personal best activities, which allow the students to develop those more personal skills. But of importance, we have an in-class activity app as well, which allows students to then directly access VVOX. So what students do is they select the button called in-class activity. They can then select launch in-class activity and that will straight away load up VVOX. And all students need to do is then type in that um, ID code from VVOX. So there's no need to sort of go online. If students are using laptops, they are more than welcome to do that. But this is just Loughborough's way of making um, VVOX, I was going to say the app, VVOX and the app a little bit more accessible as well. So this helps us as educators to increase inclusivity as well. We know that some students don't have phones or don't have smartphones, and that is absolutely fine. We always give students different ways of logging into VVOX as well. So we would never give an activity that would only be on mobile phones. We'd give the students a range of activities that they could complete as well. This is just an example of some of the, the lovely responses that my students do come up with. So this was from a lecture a couple of weeks ago when I taught applied to cognitive research. And what I did here is at the start of the lecture, before we taught anything to the students, is I just asked students what they thought about cognitive psychology or what initially came to their mind. And loads of these words were really, really relevant. Um, some students gave examples from a previous cognitive module, and that was really good. We also had students that came up with some um, some responses that weren't necessarily related to the lecture, but because the VVOX is quite um, a piece of software that encourages a lighthearted activity, there is no problem at all. The good thing is VVOX has sort of a profanity filter, so if any inappropriate words are often said, they are normally blocked out. But in the case of this example, the students were trying to guess sort of where I was originally from and what accent I had. And this was it was this VVOX activity that started off um, sort of the whole thing of students wanting to know where I was from because on the bottom of the screen there someone put the word Newcastle and I explained that that was not the case it's not my hometown so we then use more VVOX activities to try and engage the students with that topic as well. What I also do is tend to give um, students sort of um, multiple choice questions as well if I'm using these and embedding these within lectures these are the two main things that I do use but I also know that there are other activities such as um, a pin on picture activity which I will also use in practical workshops as well but in the case of these types of activities even multiple choice questions give me an idea as to how the students are developing in terms of understanding that content so with this question I only ask students if they thought eyewitness testimony was relevant today more said yes but a couple of students said they were unsure so that then allowed me to tailor the rest of the lecture and explain the concepts in a little bit more detail because sometimes we don't actually know how much the students know about a topic even if they come into their second year and we just assume that they have all of the knowledge that they should have by that point so just before we continue, uh, does anyone have any ideas about what tools they tend to use to make lectures and classes more engaging? Um, please don't say VVOX because obviously that's what this webinar is about. But if there's anything else that you tend to use or any types of activities, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to have a think to see if there's anything out there that will be suitable for you. So excellent. Actually, some of these are really, really good. Some of them I have used in the past. Some of them I haven't, so it's it's going to be a good learning curve for me because I can then sort of steal some of these ideas too. A lot of people tend to use Padlet, absolutely. We do use that at Loughborough. Um, when I use it, it, it tends to be in sort of smaller groups rather than in a lecture, just because sometimes I find that it's easier for students to log in. We've got things such as Flipgrid, absolutely. That's one of the ones that I've heard of but never used myself, so I'm absolutely going to give that a go at some point and things such as 
quizzes and videos absolutely um, I like the idea of personal stories as well so that could be in the case of maybe students telling their stories or even a lecturer telling a story as well just to make that class a little bit more engaging as well so absolutely thank you very much those are some wonderful ideas and I will state a few after this seminar so at Loughborough University we use VVOX for many reasons and the main one is that it encourages engagement and participation so what we have found is in the past when we haven't used VVOX students minds tend to wander off after 15 or 20 minutes and when we have introduced VVOX, as you'll see in the case study that I'm going to mention in a few moments time, engagement has increased. Students tend to enjoy the lectures a little bit more and they are more open minded to taking part in the lectures. I try to make the lectures and seminars and workshops and more enjoyable and VVOX helps us to do that as well. There's a wide range of activities that can be used. Some of them I would probably use more in a smaller session, a smaller session or a seminar setting, but you can essentially use VBOX in any setting that you come across. And I've used it in terms of online and offline um, situations as well. We also use VBOX because it increases inclusivity and it's very, very anonymous. So we know some students are not comfortable in putting their hands up in lectures. So we often use the Q&A function to allow those students or to allow all students to ask questions throughout the lectures. And because everything's anonymous, what we will find is that students will ask more and more questions. And this is not a bad thing. As an educator, I prefer a student to ask questions rather than sitting there and not understanding the content as well. In some cases, we do use VBOX for a little bit of entertainment. So what I have done in the past is use the pin activity where I've provided students with a picture and ask students to pinpoint a certain aspect of the picture. But what it means is that we can provide students with, you know, something that's not as formal and that's maybe not as um, sort of content based. So at times I've just put random pictures, obviously, that I've had permission to use. But sometimes it's pictures that is not even related to the content that I have used. And it's sometimes just used to refocus the students in those different situations. Uh, when I was running a cognitive psychology lecture a couple of years ago, I literally posted on the screen a picture of a house and that in a sense straight away stopped the students from doing what they were doing because they were a little bit confused but it allowed the students to refocus um, and complete that little VVOX activity as well. Now we have had quite a lot of positive feedback in terms of um, VVOX and this is what I'm going to talk about um, as we go along. Um, I will mention the case study that I've been talking about and also the feedback that we got from those students as well. So it's one thing that we will continue to use with the students. Now in general, a little bit of advice for anyone who is using VVOX. I would suggest adding in activity every 15 minutes or so. Now, in psychology, we know that students can lose concentration after about 10 or 15 minutes. Sometimes it's less. So what I do at Loughborough is every 15 to 20 minutes is I will place in a VVOX activity or a discussion activity just to break up that lecture, in particular if it's a two hour lecture as well. Now, the length of the lecture is highly important because if you only have a one hour lecture, you don't want to be overloading that with different VVOX activities. A couple of multiple choice questions is fine or something that would promote discussion. But what I have found is that there have been times where even I've made the mistake of putting in too many activities and then you don't manage to actually teach the content that you want to. I'd also suggest varying the activity. So we've got a range of activities depending upon if you are using the PowerPoint add-in as I'm using today or the VVOX dashboard, which is also there to use. And it's a case of not just repeating the same activity over and over again, because you will find that students do lose interest. And that's one of the reasons why I try not to. And finally, use the word feedback. So what we find is that if we use the word feedback, students are thinking, that they will get some sort of feedback from even the multiple choice questions as well. Now, what we've done at Loughborough University is at times staff apply for teaching best practice awards. And in these awards, staff can showcase some of the tools, what they have implemented and used within their educational practices. Now, I applied for one in the 2021-2022 academic year. And unfortunately, this was not successful because loads of staff at the time had submitted them in relation to VVOX. 
despite it being unsuccessful, um, I did get asked by our staff development team called Enhanced Academic Practice to develop some tools, some technology enhanced learning guides, which can then be downloaded by new staff, by staff who may just want to know a little bit more about VVOX. And I've also been asked to run a um, staff workshop as well. So it wasn't sort of, from my point of view, it wasn't a failure that this um, application was not successful. It's actually allowed me to think about how I use VVOX and maybe think about how I also use other tools as well. As part of that case study application, that teaching best practice application, I focus specifically on a class where I implemented VVOX myself. So I currently teach an introduction to psychology module with about 60 students in. And because these students are at foundation level, they come in at a variety of levels. So some students have studied psychology and some haven't. So what I did is as part of this, I introduced VVOX into all of the lectures. So these were things like word cloud activities and the multiple choice questions. But in the seminars, I used the other activities such as the rating skills or the pin activities. And in particular, the Q&A function was used nearly every week when students were asked, um, or when students asked the staff questions about the module. And what we did is after, um, after the module was finished, we actually took feedback from the students and it was a lot more positive than we thought. So on the screen there, we just have um, some of the comments that came from the staff student liaison committee and also emails that were from students themselves. So students actually sent me quite a few lovely emails with um, sort of thanks for using Revox and making the sessions more interactive. Now, the staff student liaison committee gave us um, a lot of positive feedback from the students and they said the students really appreciated the use of Revox because it helped them to understand the content a bit more. Students also said that um, using VVOX was not just a repeat of the lectures. We gave the students different activities so that they could test their own knowledge as well. Now, students appreciated the fact that everything was anonymous. So students felt as though they could ask questions as and when they needed support. And this then allowed me to explain answers in detail. And I wasn't sort of targeting any student in particular. We also had the generic module feedback at the end of the year and essentially students really enjoyed the activities and that was sort of across the board. I don't think there was any negative comments at all about VVOX. A lot of students said that it made the lectures more interesting, a lot more engaging. And as I mentioned before, it allowed the students to actually refocus upon what they were doing in the lecture because it broke up that lecture content as well. Now, one of the, um, the most important comments that I received was that one student thought that it was good because if they felt as though they were not going to be laughed at when they provide answers and ask questions. What you do find is that when you are in large lecture situations, some students will be um, not comfortable in putting their hands up to ask questions or respond to questions. So VVOX is quite a useful method to um, provide students with feedback, but on a, in a more anonymous and more comfortable way as well. So what are we going to do next? So in terms of using VVOX, we've already used it for formative feedback. So what we are going to do is now look at using VVOX for mid-module feedback. Now what we do is at Loughborough, we take feedback at multiple time points of the year. At the end of the year, we do the official sort of Moodle feedback and the learn questionnaires. But during the mid-modules, what we do is we tend to use VVOX. And there are many ways in which we do this. Um, and the main reason is it makes the feedback or giving feedback a little bit more interesting. It's not just us asking students to fill out a questionnaire. We can use VVOX activities to get that feedback off students. So I'll provide some examples in a moment, but we can use word cloud activities to get the positives and the improvements. And because it's fully anonymous, students are actually not scared to do it. What you will find is that when students give feedback and their names are attached to that, that can make it more difficult for students to provide feedback as well. But the most interesting thing I found is that when I have done mid-module feedback, I will often run it as sort of a live activity so students can see straight away what their perceptions are of the module. And that just means we as educators are being quite transparent. We are not sort of hiding any results from the students in that we can see that some students dislike modules, and they, they need improvement and that's absolutely fine 
But on the other side of that, we also know that there are quite a few positives in terms of those modules as well. So all our students give feedback via um, VVOX, staff can then still access everything in the VVOX dashboard. So we can see how many students responded, the types of responses that were given as well. So this gives us those results and we can then look at those results in more detail after the activities have been undertaken. Now, in general at Loughborough, we tend to do two types of activities for the mid-module feedback. The first one is a word cloud, as we've already said, asking students what they like about the module on the left hand side there of the screen. And on the right hand side there, we ask students to rate their agreement with their overall module satisfaction. And I did this a few weeks ago for one of the modules that I ran, um, Applied Cognitive Research. And thankfully, the students actually do enjoy the module quite a lot. They did give us some improvements as well. We're not saying it's perfect. But this allowed us to gain a bit more of an understanding what the students really want out of a module so it was it was good for that case as well we've also been able to produce another technology enhanced learning guide which specifically focuses on, on how we can use revox revox and mid module feedback so after i had applied for that previous teaching best practice award Enhanced Academic Practice at Loughborough sort of staff development team did contact me to ask if I would be interested in developing a mid-module feedback guide of how to use Revox and how to implement those different activities. So what we know is that staff can log on online, they can download those guides and have a look to see how this will be useful to implement that mid-module feedback as well. Just a quick example there. So this is an example of how to import a, a, a pre-built survey. So what staff can do is they can import different surveys or they can essentially develop a poll or a survey of their own. We've given the details for staff to do either way, whichever way they are most comfortable with as well. But everything's online. And as you can see there from the image on the screen, there's a tab along the top which says VVOX and everything related to VVOX is underneath there as well. So just to conclude, um, formative feedback is very important for students, but not just for students, it is important for us as educators as well. We've got many pieces of software available out there. So we've got Kahoot and we've got other pieces of software such as Socrative and some of the other tools that um, you have suggested earlier in the talk as well. But I'm not going to lie, Revox is one of my favourites and I will continue to use it for as long as it's here. We also know that VVOX can make lectures and practical workshops engaging, but actually it's got other uses as well. We can use it for mid-module feedback and we can collect views and opinions for the students as well. So I just want to say thank you for listening. If anyone does have any questions, you are free to email me after this webinar or if anyone's watching this online, please do sort of look at my details as well. But thank you very much. Laura. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. I learned a lot. Honestly, it was really good. And I, I think it's definitely really interesting to kind of touch on the different aspects of engaging students. I've, I've really yeah. enjoyed it and you're yeah. very engaging. So thank you so much again. Lovely, um, thank you. <laughs> very welcome. Just going to change presenters back. One moment. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So thank you so much again, Laura. And so I want to move into our Q&A portion. We can see we have a couple of questions here for you. If anyone does have any questions, like Laura said, you can give her an email after this. But what I'll do is I'll just start from the bottom and then I'll just work our way up. So starting for the first one, is it possible in VBOX to know how individuals performed, i.e. not anonymously? I mean, I, I can take that because it's more of a, a technical question. Yeah, please but, do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But yes, it is absolutely possible to see who is answering questions in a particular way. VVOX is automatically anonymous, but it is not necessarily always anonymous. You have the option of running your sessions in identified mode. So this is where students will enter their names from the beginning of the lecture or the lesson. And then you'll be able to see that in the back end in your data report, who that is. If this is something that you may think will put your students off from being truly honest, as we've talked about, you know, one of the key things that students put is not being made fun of, uh, you know, not being identified, they could share their voices authentically. We do have an option of hybrid. So there is an option where students put in their name in the beginning and they are able to be seen in the back end with their names identified, but everything that they comment is completely anonymous. 
So I think that's a really good kind of in-between. But yes, you'll absolutely be able to see how, how individuals perform in Vbox. Oh, so let's just go to... Oh, someone put a, a help guide. Absolutely. So yeah, you can use... <laughs> Thank you so much, whoever that was. But yes, you can put in right here. I can highlight it. You can um, go to identifying participants. Thank you so much, Trevor, who put that. Let's see, the next question. Do you use VBOX mainly in large group teaching? How do you use it differently in small settings, if so? Um, so I use it in all types of teaching. So I've got large lectures of over 300 students. I've got smaller lectures and maybe 100 students, but I also use it in small workshops as well. Right. And what, what I tend to do is because in a lecture, you've got a PowerPoint, I'll, I'll tend to use the word cloud activities or um, the multiple choice questions. But when it comes to sort of smaller practical workshops or seminars, that's when I'll use more of the Vivox dashboard and this way you can um, use the pin on activity and some of the rating skills as well. Because um, yeah. I find those work better with a smaller number of students. Because mm -hmm. if you've got 300 students trying to put a pin on an image, that's it's quite scary. I've tried to do that before and it really hasn't worked. So it's it usually I just try and vary the activities. Um, but I've I've used them in, in all sorts of areas. I'm, I'm, I haven't been restricted as such, or not yet anyway, in, in how I've used Vbox. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's 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 good to know that there's no uh, limits on how you can use it. <laughs> I love it. That's yeah. good to hear. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let me, okay. Let's see. I'll go for do this one next. Would you say Vbox is more useful? Um, in the younger, less confident age ranges. Um, what would you say on that, Laura? What's um, your I would say definitely yes. Um, what you will find is that um, the younger, so I teach foundation level, um, and those students are not overly confident in responding and directly asking questions. So I tend to use VBOX more in those situations. Mm. Um, and I've also used it with sort of secondary school children as well when I've given, um, and college students as well when I've given different talks and when you don't actually know the audience very well and the, the the children and the students may not be as comfortable so absolutely I would say it's prob yeah I wouldn't say it's more useful I would say it's probably as equally useful but it just engages the students in a different way depending upon what age groups they are. Wonderful I, I think that's a really good answer let's go to this next question have you integrated VBOX in Blackboard? Um, so we use, we don't use Blackboard, we use Moodle, so we call this Learn. Um, um, I don't think that we've integrated it into there yet, whether it's in the pipeline, I'm not 100% sure. But this is why we've got VBOX as an app on, um, so students can download the app and access VBOX straight away. Um, mm. I'm not sure if there's plans on integrating it into Moodle because we have got um, sort of other pieces of software such as um, H5P that we can integrate. So it's, it may be on the cards, it may not be. I'm, it's, I'm not sort of in a place to give opinions on that one, but. Yeah, absolutely, no, completely fair enough. Um, thanks for the link, absolutely. To whoever that was, thank you so much. <laughs> that was incredibly helpful. <laughs> well, let's see, okay, this is the one I didn't click off before, so. What question type is the student most liked by the students? Um, definitely word clouds. So the word clouds give the students a bit more freedom. So in the example that I gave at the start, where students had asked about applied cognitive psychology, that then, because we, we don't sort of restrict the students in what they put in, uh, we don't sort of tell the students to be, you know, really professional, that it's quite informal, we find that students will pretty much put anything in a word cloud and if we make the students aware that they can do that, then that's absolutely fine, as, as long as it's nothing offensive. Um, so the word cloud at the start, then sort of this, it then allowed me to do another word cloud, which was not even related to what I was teaching. And loads of the students were guessing about where my accent was from and that sort of thing. And it just helped and refocus the students. So I would say from my point of view, that is probably the one where students will get involved with. And, and I would say it's probably more useful for us as staff as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I say, actually, you're not alone in that. I've, I've found whenever I've done training sessions or talked to other lecturers like yourself, I've, they've said that the word cloud is incredibly helpful for breaking the ice yeah. and getting involved. 
it just it really does help to kind of just kind of warm students up get them speaking and because you can put multiple answers in yeah. they, they find it really nice just to kind of get their voices out there and actually seeing it as a visual i completely yeah. agree Let's see I used VBOX with TPG and teaching masterclasses for corporate clients, and it has been very effective with, oh, thank you, this is just, this is just, this is a, I was reading it live, this is the compliment, thank you so much. See, yeah. I didn't read something before, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really good, I mean, I've used it when I've been to international conferences before, and it's, like, it just engages the audience a lot more than if you're just standing there giving slides it, so I, I completely agree with that comment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I was just reading that live and then I just saw it was, a, it was a nice little thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. OK, so final two. Let's go to this one. Um, and again, thank you so much for all of your questions. They've been incredibly helpful. So let's see. Do you mainly use VVox anonymously or other times identified identification is used in your classes? Um, for me, I'll, I'll mostly always use it anonymously because the time is where I haven't. It's decreased a decreased engagement so if you sort of ask students to put the names in or even like a some sort of nickname even students and sometimes not comfortable in doing that so for me i would always sort of go to the anonymous version first and then as the semester progresses you, you can then start and maybe use the identification version but for me i would always just stick with the anonymous version unless i was very comfortable with a group of students yeah yeah. I, I think that's a good differentiation. Once you've you've built that trust, I, I think yes. that's a really nice, yeah, kind of leap from that. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Laura, final question. How do you feel? Thank you. <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Okay. Final question. Do you prefer the VBOX presenter or PowerPoint integration? Um, I don't actually have a preference because I use them for different things. When I'm giving a lecture, I prefer the PowerPoint integration because mm -hmm. it saves us moving backwards and forwards from from sort of the, the dashboard to the slides. However, at Loughborough, um, where we've got the presenter view, um, we actually have a nice purple and pink sort of Loughborough background. So when we give sort of practical workshops and different activities to students, it, it makes them, you know, look a bit more sort of, it's a mixture of VVox and Loughborough branded as well. So it's I use those for more um, sort of the smaller classes. So I don't have a preference just because I, I use them for different things yeah okay completely fair enough right yeah. i think that is the end of our q a portion so i think that also brings us to the end of today's webinar i want to say a massive thank you to you laura wonderful presentation and thank you so much for ag agreeing to be part of this we appreciate it i appreciate you so much um, thank you very welcome and thanks to thank you to everyone who's watching today like i said this is the second installment we've had one before and our final one will be on april 26 with alex pitchford and he will be talking about increasing engagement and active learning using vbox in math and science so look out for that i will be sending out the email very shortly just as a reminder but until then thank you so much this has been a wonderful time you can catch this recorded on um, our youtube channel so please make sure to like and subscribe to that and make sure any notifications to hit the bell because we always are updating with either our webinar series or wonderful tips and tricks for you. And thank you again to, as a member of our community. We have a community here in VBOX, our edu community. So you can go on to type in VBOX community into Google and you can see all the information about that and what we do there. It's been wonderful being with you. And again, Laura, thank you so much for joining me. But until then, have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.